Today uh, I thought we'd talk about something called optic flow. So this is uh, something that you might not have heard about before, but it actually turns up in quite a lot of different things. So very broadly, optic flow is about understanding how things are moving in an image. So at the, at the pixel level, how motion is happening. So how things are moving around across the whole image. And this is useful for a number of reasons. If you've got a wobbly, shaky camera, you can use it for image stabilization. <laughs> I wasn't insinuating anything. Um, yeah, so you can use optic flow to see what kind of global motion is happening and sort of take that out. Drones, things like that, some of them have got optical sensors that will kind of look at sort of how the world's moving around them. So this isn't about tracking sort of individual objects or things. This is about seeing how the global motion, all the surfaces in the scene are moving around. If you can kind of break up the scene by motion, uh, it's another way of segmenting an image or labeling an image, um, if you've seen some videos about that before. So uh, in addition to things like color or texture, you can use how things are moving around to help sort of figure out how to divide up a scene. So like, almost like 3D, I suppose, if you get a parallax, if I move yeah, this exactly. across here, you can see that you're moving differently to the window. Exactly, and you can, other, you can pull out some other things there as well. So things closer to the camera tend to move faster. So you get kind of an idea of depth. And there's certain techniques such as something called structure from motion, which does exactly that. It figures out how things appear in 3D by seeing how the camera moves around. Let's have a think about sort of what's going on in an image as you move a camera. So uh, obviously an image is composed of loads of pixels, potentially millions of pixels. And when you move your camera around, there's some kind of uh, change happening in those pixels. And what we want to figure out is uh, how that motion at an individual pixel level is happening. Okay, So that means pretty much for every pixel in the image, we want to try and apply some kind of motion vector to it to understand where it's moving to. Okay, now this is a pretty hard problem. Um, there's many, many pixels uh, in the image and to understand exactly how each of them are moving, we're gonna have to kind of make some assumptions and some simplifications. And that's where uh, the optic flow techniques kind of come in. So this is a really simple image here where we've just got sort of one shape in the middle of it like this, perhaps a ball or something like that. And if we're calculating optic flow across this image and the ball is moving, what we're gonna end up with is remember this is sort of every single pixel, we're gonna get these flow vectors. When we're talking about optic flow, um, really what we're considering is sort of the motion at this level within the object or surface that's moving, what's going on, okay? So here I've drawn some pretty bad optic flow vectors showing that maybe this ball is sort of moving down. And if the background was moving as well, you know, perhaps you'd have lots of vectors over the background showing that the background was moving a certain way. So different surfaces in the image can move in different directions, um, but it's important to remember that we're just working at the pixel level. So we're trying to uh, pick apart what's happening on individual pixels within the image. So this is um, quite complicated to do because the real world is complicated. So um, we have to make a lot of assumptions in order to try and pull out the motion of essentially these individual pixels that represent something called motion flow, and that's something sort of moving through the real world. So if I move something around, that's moving in the real world, but how does it move on the image? We've just got this 2D plane of pixels, um, so how do we understand from that how something's moving sort of in 3D? So there's a number of assumptions that we have to make. Uh, one of the assumptions that we have to make um, is that the things like the lighting doesn't change. Okay, so if you, if you think of this piece of paper, if I move my hand across it and we get a shadow, then optic flow techniques might pick up on that shadow as being something actually moving in the image rather than just the lighting changing. So one thing we have to assume is that lighting isn't, isn't changing too much. Um, and obviously in the real world, that's quite challenging because we get lots of shadows and, and stuff happening that we it's going to confuse these kind of approaches. Um, so another sort of simplification that we make is that when we're looking at this flow, we only do it over very small changes in, in time. So unlike tracking where we might be following something through a whole video sequence, here we're just looking at two frames. So we'll take two neighboring frames out of a video and see how the pixels have moved between them. 
As well as having things like lighting changing, which can break optic flow, another problem we can get sort of the other way around is that maybe there's not enough features on a surface to be able to detect the difference anyway. I was going to show you an example with a ball, but the only really shiny ball I could find was this tiny one. So if you spin it, it's spinning, of course, but you can't see it spinning because you can't see the texture turning around on the ball, especially because it's reflecting lighting, which isn't moving. So one of the problems we have with optic flow is that we're making all these assumptions, you know, such that we can actually see things moving and that's not always true. One of the key constraints we make when we're writing down how we're going to calculate optic flow is this idea of a brightness constraint. And what that really means is if we've got our image here like this, we've got the intensity at a particular point. So at this point here, our brightness in our image, so our grayscale value, so the higher it is, the nearer it is to white, the lower it is, the nearer it is to black, is at a position x comma y, so that's our pixel, at a particular time t. And what we're thinking about is Essentially, where has the thing at that pixel here moved to in the next frame? So it's going to have moved only a little bit, even much smaller than that actually, but let's draw it like that. So we've got our new position here that we think this information has moved to, whatever's in the real world has moved here uh, in the image. And so this is going to be essentially the brightness at x plus a little bit, y plus a little bit at t plus a little bit. So we've got some changes happening in space, x plus a little bit, y plus a little bit, and also a change happening in time as well. So because we've got these little changes, you can use actually derivatives, you can use some neat tricks where we're just looking at gradients um, in the image to figure out this equation. We can rewrite it as something called the optic flow equation, which just basically uses image derivatives to look at changes in grayscale um, over very tiny patches. Of course, if you want to calculate derivatives in, in an image, you can use um, things like kernels, like the Sabel kernel, which I think Mike's done a video on before. So the maths boils down to essentially being able to do pixel-wise calculations to do with grayscale. So looking in neighboring re regions to see changes in space and looking at changes over time as well, so differences between uh, frames. I'm looking at that now from my videographer head and thinking at 4K, 60 frames per second. Yeah, this is a lot fast. of calculations, yeah. right? So there's a few tricks. Um, so perhaps that leads nicely onto how a few people have solved this, because this is the problem. And actually now you've got a load of different optimization techniques that will try and give you these vectors. Where we've moved to here, this is kind of known as U and V. So these are our motion vectors that we've got everywhere in the image, and you're right. It can take a little while to calculate that. So we've thought about how um, you can talk about optic flow with little changes in space and little changes in time. That means derivatives and so things like Sabel. Um, Another which thing we would can be if you had a camera with a fairly high ISO settings, you had a lot of grainy noise, that's going to produce a sort of low level edge over everything. <laughs> 